And there's a father named Christopher Greger, and he claims that his son, Corey, died of natural causes. But the prosecutors say, no, he abused the child to death. Now, the defendant, the father, facing life in prison if he's found guilty of first-degree murder. Let's get you back inside the courtroom. Opening statements are done. We're about to hear from the state's very first witness. This is Corey's mom, Brianna Michelow. You sign the swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth. Yes. Would you have a seat, please? State your full name for the record and spell both of your names. It's Brianna Michelow, B R E A N N A M I C C I O L O. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Brianna, just before we start, I just want to remind you that you're going to have to keep your voice up, okay? Because okay. the jury's going to have to hear you. So, um, Brianna, how old are you? I'm 27. And what is your birth date? November 7th, 1996. And where do you live? East Brunswick. And whom do you live with? My boyfriend and daughter. And do you work? Yes. And what is your occupation? Data entry. Who is Corey Michelow? My son. And when did you give birth to Corey? May 1st, 2014. And how old were you when you gave birth to Corey? 17. And what grade were you in when you gave birth to Corey? 11th grade. And who is Corey's biological father? The defendant. Man, take this microphone and just slide it right in front of you, okay? Okay. Right, right in the middle there, as far as it goes. That's as far as it goes. Let me turn it over to you. I want, you to, I want you to pretend that you're basically speaking all the way to the end of the jury box, all right? All the jurors need to hear you and see you. If they can't hear you down there, it's like you're not testifying, okay? okay. So I know it may be difficult, but please try and keep your voice up. So who is Corey's biological father? The defendant. And what's his name? Christopher Greger. And how old were you when you first met Christopher Greger? Uh, 16. And do you know what the defendant's uh, birth date is? Um, it's May 1992. Now, you're familiar with Christopher Greger, correct? Yes. And you've known him for many years, right? Yes. And you see him located in the courtroom today? I do. And can you please point to him and tell us uh, where he's seated and what he's wearing? He's sitting over there wearing a suit. Identifying Mr. Greger, you are. So noted, thank you. Now, is your son, Corey, no longer with us? No. Well, yes. And can you tell the jury the day he passed? April 2nd, 2021. And how old was Corey when he passed? He was six. And what types of things did your son Corey like to do as a six-year-old? Um, he liked reading, coloring, painting, um, playing outside. And what type of demeanor did Corey have as a six-year-old? Um, he was happy, silly, loving. Permission to approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, certainly. Right. Okay. I'm now showing you what's been marked S1 for identification purposes. And do you recognize that? Yes. Okay. And, and is that a picture? Yes. And can you um, tell the jurors what that's a picture of? Oh, that's a picture of Corey. And did you take that picture? Yes. So you're familiar with yes. your son, Corey, who's depicted in the picture? Yes. Your Honor, permission to publish S1? Any objections? None. Are you ready to get the evidence first? Or? We can move it into evidence, yes. Move yes. into evidence and publish. No objection to into evidence? No, Your Honor. S1 and evidence. Now, Brianna, can you tell the jurors who's depicted in that picture? My son, Corey. And how old was he in that picture? Six. And who took that picture? I did. And can you um, tell the jurors what you were doing when you took that picture of Corey? Um, we were at the park playing in the snow. OK. Now, 
Mariana, how old was Corey when the defendant entered his life? He was five. And was there a paternity test? Yes. And how old was Corey when it was determined that the defendant was his biological father? Around four. And calling your attention to October 28th of 2020, were you and the defendant granted joint custody of Corey? Yes. And when that happened, who became the resident parent of Corey? Christopher. And when I say resident parent, can you tell us what that means? Um, he resided with him. And did you have visitation? Yes. And was this ordered by the family court in Middlesex County? Yes. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness counsel? Yes, of course. The, the order? Yeah, sure. Your Honor, permission to approach? Yes. Thank you. Brianna, I'm now going to show you what's been marked um, S2 for identification purposes. And can you tell the jury what that is? It's a court order. Okay. And where is it a court order from? Um, is it from the um, family, family court? Okay. And on top of this order, is there a date present on S2 where it says filed? Yes, it's October 28th, 2020. Okay, and can you tell um, the jurors what the judge's name is on this uh, order? Judge Silva. Okay. And going down into this order where it says it is on this 28th day of October 2020 ordered as follows, can you please read for the jurors what it says in number one? Yes. It says the party shall attend court-sponsored mediation on the issues of parenting time and defendant Christopher Greger's name change application. Said mediation will take place at a date and time to be set by the court's mediator. Okay, and continuing on, can you please read? The party shall join, uh, share joint legal custody of the minor child, Corey, date of birth, May 1st, 2014, pendente like basis. Mm -hmm. Defendant Christopher Greger shall continue to be the parent of primary residence and defendant Brianna shall have unsupervised parenting time as follows. Could you please continue? Alternating weekends beginning November 6, 2020 from Friday at 5.30 until Sunday at 6 p.m. Brianna shall pick up and drop off Corey at Christopher's home. Okay, can you continue on, Brianna? Wednesday evenings from 4.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Brianna shall pick up and drop off Corey at Christopher's home. No one except Brianna and Rebecca shall be present in the home during Brianna's parenting time and whoever has the child during a scheduled extracurricular activity shall transport him to the activity, however the other parent may attend. Okay, and then going to um, number three, does it talk about the parties unblocking each other from the other cell phone? Yes. And then going to um, number four, does it talk about the parties shall engage in co-parenting counseling? Yes. And then um, going to number six, it talks about the parties being barred from making disparaging remarks, correct? Correct. And then it goes to go on to give a, a holiday schedule for Thanksgiving and Christmas? Correct. And what does number eight say, please? Brianna Mitchell shall have Skype calls or FaceTime calls with Corey on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays and Sundays during the weekends when Corey is with Christopher. 
Similarly, on the weekends that Corey is with Brianna, Christopher shall have Skype or FaceTime with Corey on Saturdays and Sundays. Neither party shall record these calls. Okay. And the caption of this order is, who is the plaintiff in the matter? My mom. Okay, and who is listed as the defendants in the order? Myself and Christopher. Okay. Now, Brianna, have you struggled with substance abuse? Yes. And have you specifically struggled with drugs? Yes. And can you please tell the jurors about this? Yes. Um, in my early 20s, um, I struggled with um, drug abuse. Um, when I was younger, I went through a lot, and I feel like I used the drugs to, like, suppress my emotions. I didn't really have um, the coping skills that I do now. And, um, I, I, yeah, like I said, I was just going through a lot, but I've been clean currently for a long time. And have you ever used drugs in front of your son, Corey? No. And can you tell us why you were granted custody of Corey in October of 2020? Um, I went through a drug program and I provided clean um, urines and um, I just fought really hard because I, I hated living without my son. Now calling your attention to September of 2020, where was Corey living? Um, in Barnegat. Okay, and who was Corey living with? Um, the defendant. And where did the defendant reside? In Barnegat. Okay. Um, what, Atlantic Heights. Okay, when you say the Atlantic Heights, can, can you tell the jurors what that is? Um, it's an apartment complex. And did the defendant move from his parents' home in Monroe Township to the apartment in Barnegat? Yes. And who else lived in the apartment in Barnegat with Corey and the defendant? Just them. Now, Rihanna, in October of 2020, can you tell the jurors where you were living? Um, in English town. And what type of home did you live in in English Town? A townhome. And who lived in the townhome in English Town? Um, myself, my mother, my mother's boyfriend, and my sister. And can you describe for the jurors what the townhome looked like in English Town? Um, it was two stories with a finished basement. And where was your room located in the house? In the basement. And can you tell the jurors how come you were living in your mother's home in October of 2020? Um, I wasn't working at the time, so I couldn't afford it. And about how far away is English Town, New Jersey from Barnegat, New Jersey? About an hour. Now, in October of 2020, what grade was Corey in? He was in first grade. And what school did Corey attend? Cecil S. Collins. All right, still with us, West Coast trial lawyer Ron Zambrano. Ron, tell me what you think of this first witness. Tearful, she's lost her son. They're owning that she had drug issues. How do you think it's going? It's extremely powerful. I mean, she, she's obviously, um, compared to the picture that was that 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 was on screen. She's clearly uh, looking the part of, of, a, of a grieving money, mother who's responsible, but there are these things again, the, these are bad facts that they're embracing and they're, 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 they're heading straight on, but she looks like a grieving mother. And, and it is important to note that the father wasn't involved until uh, four years into this boy's life. So, but then again, she has her own issues, but I think she's doing a good job of, of, of conveying like, listen, I, I had my mistakes, but I was trying to do my best. And looks like it was, it was her mom who was really looking out for the welfare of both of them. And she, uh, the grandma. Yeah, the grandma. I agree with you. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Ron, but she did own again. Yeah, I wasn't working. I was living with my mom, these other family members, but also touch on the defendant's demeanor because he is making eye contact with her. He is watching her. I feel like his demeanor is a little bit um, like he's angry or just uh, perturbed that she's up there saying these things. 
Well, I, I, I was observing the same thing during the defense opening, how he, just how his mannerism runs. And I think he just comes, that, that's his default when he's just sad uh, and upset. But he's definitely, I think he just, he just kind of looks like a mean guy. But then again, he had the same look when he started crying during the opening. So it's hard to read if the jury's paying attention like we are. But I agree with you. I mean, he is, he is locked in on her and he looks really, really upset. But then again, if he really believes that she's responsible for the death of their son, I can't blame them. It's, it's a it's a really tough one. They're, they're, yeah. Neither one of them are perfect citizens. Yeah, absolutely. But also I question if he was crying or not. I saw him wiping his eyes a lot, but I couldn't quite tell if he was really crying right. or not. We'll continue to monitor that. Thank you so much, Ron, for joining me this hour. Greatly appreciate it. Michael Ayala joining me next for more testimony from the victim's mom in the treadmill abuse murder trial. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Back to Court TV Live, I'm Ashley Wilcox. And I'm Michael Ayala. We're both here today giving you your front row seat to justice. And we are in New Jersey this afternoon for our newest live trial, the Treadmill Abuse Murder Trial. Defendant Christopher Greger is charged with murder and endangering the welfare of a child in connection to his son's death in April of 2021. Now, Greger told investigators that he took his son, six-year-old Corey Michelow, to the hospital after he started experiencing symptoms of nausea and shortness of breath. Now, while at the hospital, Corey began having seizures, and just about an hour after arriving, Corey was pronounced dead. Well, now Gregor is facing life in prison if found guilty of abusing and ultimately killing his son. Right now, let's go back into court where the jury is hearing from the state's first witness, Corey's mother, Brianna Mitchell. Elementary school, what town is that located in? Barnegat. Now, calling your attention to March 19th of 2021, did you have visitation of Corey that weekend? Yes. And can you tell the jurors when did your visitation start with Corey that weekend? March 19th. Okay, and that would have been a Friday, Friday. night? Friday. And where did you go to have your visitation with Corey on Friday the 19th? The defendant's home. And why did you go to the defendant's apartment on the 19th to visit Corey? Um, the court order made it hard to go back to my house, and um, I just didn't want to fight with him. It was just easier than actually fighting with him. Okay, and when you're talking about the court order, are you referring to the court order from October um, 28th of 2020? Yes. And are you specifically referring to subsection C, that no one except Brianna and Rebecca shall be present in a home during Brianna's parenting time? Yes. So during that time frame, Brianna, um, was it common for you to go see Corey at the defendant's apartment? Yes. And calling your attention specifically to the 19th, did you sleep at the defendant's apartment that night? Yes. And why did you stay at the dependent's, defendant's apartment that night? Um, the next day I had something to do with Corey early. And during that time period, was it common for you to stay over the defendant's home um, during your visitations with Corey? Yes. And was the defendant always there when you would stay at the apartment to visit Corey? Yes. He was always there? Yes. Okay. And what if the defendant had plans? Um, he would leave and it would just be me and Corey. Now calling your attention to Saturday, March 20th at 2021, did you take Corey for the day? Yes. And did you previously discuss your plans with the defendant? I did. And can you tell the jurors where you and Corey went? I took Corey to Pennsylvania to visit my dad for his birthday. And what part of Pennsylvania did you go to? Abington. And what did you and Corey and your dad do in Abington, Pennsylvania? We went mini golfing and we got ice cream. And about how far of a drive would it be from Barnegat, New Jersey to Abington, Pennsylvania? 
About an hour and a half. And what time that day were you supposed to bring Corey back home from the visitation? Between two and three. And when you were driving back to Barnegat, what were the traffic conditions that day? There was a lot of traffic. And what happened due to the traffic? I was late. And besides the traffic conditions, why were you also running late? Um, Corey was enjoying himself, so I didn't want to just rip him away from that. And who did you tell that you were going to be late that day in bringing him back? The defendant. And did the defendant send you a text message on March 20th at approximately 3.04 p.m. about you being late? Yes. Your Honor, um, permission to um, approach? Yes. Michael, so far she's really describing a typical one parent has custody, the other has visitation. A little unusual she stayed there overnight when she had visits with Corey, but nothing standing out so far to me. No, I mean, the only thing that stands out is the fact that I guess he was a newer father at that time, right? Because he wasn't in the child's life earlier on. And there's always an adjustment period for a young person, especially a young Point. man, when suddenly they find out that this is a situation. I actually had a friend who was in that situation, mm. and it was a very difficult transition for him. So you can understand that things like that might set things off balance. And you can understand then why maybe she spent the night and the father had some time to go, Christopher did, go live his life while she was safely with the child. Sure. And Sure. Kind of sounds like that. All right, yeah. I understand the sidebar's over. Let's go back in. As lie for identification purposes, and do you recognize those? I do. And can you tell the jurors what those are? There are text messages between me and the defendant. And you're familiar with those text messages? Yes. And are those text messages that were located in your cell phone? Yes. Okay, now during the course of this investigation, um, did you provide your cellular phone to the Ocean County Prosecutor's Office? Yes. And when did you provide your cell phone to the Ocean County Prosecutor's Office? Um, the day Corey passed. And you provided your cell phone to Detective Mitchell? Correct. And by doing this, you um, voluntarily agreed that the um, Prosecutor's Office would search your phone? Yes. So calling your attention now to S5 um, in particular um, at approximately 304, um, what did the defendant text you in regard to you dropping off Corey on uh, March uh, 20th, 21 at approximately 304? He texted me, when you get here, please just drop him off. And what was your response? I said, okay. And then what did he say next? He said, what did the defendant say next? He said, this Friday, however long late you are, is how long after 4.30 you can come. Can you continue, please? He what said, did he say next? FYI, this is beyond pissing me off now. My entire plans for today are ruined. What did you respond? I'm driving as fast as I can. There was traffic, I'm sorry. And he said, I don't care. Whenever you get here, we will take the difference in time from 2 o'clock until then. And that is how long we will add on to 4.30 for when you come on Friday now. And then can you tell us? Yes. He said, I'm at the clubhouse gym. Just drop him off here. I said, OK. And then again, I said, he can't get in. And then I said, I apologize for being so late. And I mean it. I'm not saying this because I want you to change your mind about Friday. 
I will come at 6.45, no problem. It's understandable, but I did want to tell you that there was no in ill intentions there. I didn't mean to be so late. Okay, so the text message that you're referring to regarding the um, clubhouse gym, can you tell for the jurors uh, what time that that uh, text message is from regarding Corey um, not being able to, to get in? At 4.15, no, 4.14 p.m. Okay. Thank you, Brad. So, Brianna, on March um, 20th of 2021, at approximately 4.15, did you drop off Corey to his father at the clubhouse gym at the Atlantic Heights apartment complex? Yes. And had you ever been inside the gym located at the um, clubhouse gym? I have. And can you just briefly describe what the clubhouse gym looks like? Um, there's weights and treadmills. And where did you park when you dropped Corey off that day? By the entrance of the clubhouse. And did Corey have issues getting inside of the gym? Yes. And can you expl please explain what happened um, regarding Corey being able to enter the clubhouse gym on March 20th of 2021? The door was locked. So um, I texted the defendant that he couldn't get in. And then what happened after that? Um, he came and unlocked the door. And what was the defendant's demeanor when he let Corey into the gym and then at that point in time? He was very angry. And at any point during this, did he come to your car? Yes. After you dropped Corey off on March 20th, 2021, when is the next time that you saw Corey? Um, I believe it was Tuesday. Would that have been March 23rd, yes. 2021? And on that particular day, did you drive to Barnegat? Yes. And did you drive there to visit Corey? Yes. And where did you visit with Corey that day? The defendant's home. And about what time do you think did you arrive at the uh, defendant's apartment to, to visit with Corey? Um, maybe 4.30. And that would have been um, your weekday visitation with Corey? Yes. So it would have been like after the school day? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. And where was the defendant when you visited Corey? He was home. And. Did you stay over the apartment that night? No. All right, she's describing the defendant as angry when she dropped Corey off. She was late, she admits that he was very angry. It starts to paint the picture, I think the prosecution wants, that he's an abuser. Yeah, and you know, oftentimes we see this when a parent is mad at another parent, mm -hmm. they take it out on the child. Yeah, unfortunately. All right, we're gonna hit the pause button. You won't miss any of the mother's testimony as she describes what happens on these times she was visiting with her own son, Corey. Stay tuned. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a closer look at the crime scene in the trial of Karen Reed, the Massachusetts woman who claims that she's being framed for the murder of her police officer boyfriend. Plus, a deep dive into new revelations from today's gripping testimony. What was the question that she asked? Is he dead? We're live from Massachusetts with the latest in the killer or cover-up murder trial. Closing Argument with Vinny Palatan. Tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Back to New Jersey for the treadmill abuse murder trial. Defendant Christopher Greger is accused of murdering his six-year-old son, Corey, after repeated abuse, including making him run on a treadmill until he couldn't stand. The defense, however, says that Corey died from natural causes and that it was his mom, Brianna Michiola, who was the one who abused her son. Now, before we get you back into court, let's bring in trial attorney Latif Gray. Latif, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Um, first and foremost, I want to get your thoughts on how um, mom is doing on the stand. Um, an important witness to sort of set the scene. Um, she looks great. She's obviously, hopefully, turned her life around. But how do you think she's doing at this point? 
Mom is doing well. Mom comes across as a concerned mother, a concerned parent who uh, tried to do everything she could to make sure that her child was safe. And um, in displaying these text messages, I think she's uh, portraying the defendant as someone who has a temper problem and seems to fly off the handle for the smallest little infractions. You know, yet again, the words of the defendant being used against them right now, it's in form of those text messages. Do you anticipate, in a case like this, where the defense was very strong in the opening to point the finger at the mother and then say natural causes for the death, do you think we're going to hear from the defendant during the defense's case? It's a bit too early to tell. Uh, it, it, oftentimes it depends on how the evidence shakes out. But uh, given what I know about the case and what I've heard about the case, I wouldn't expect him to get on the stand. That's just my thoughts. And I just want to say one more thing, and that sure. is it's a really great point of the strategy of a case that that's not a decision that you can make before trial starts. You have to assess it as you go. Yeah, I think if you get to a point where you feel like a Hail Mary is the only chance you got, you might try it. But I agree with Latif. I think right now what we know about him, his background, his anger issues, everything that went on, putting him on the stand would be a mistake. Mm. You know, too much to come out there. Um, all right, we're going to go back now for more. The direct examination of Corey's mom. While you were with Corey, did you see any bruises on him? I did, yes. And can you describe for the jurors the bruises that you saw? Um, he had a bruise on his forehead, and it was very odd-shaped, and it kind of looked like an imprint of something. And besides that bruise, did you see another bruise? He had one on his chest. It looked like a scrape. And... Where were you when you saw these bruises on Corey? Um, Corey and I went on a walk in the neighborhood. And did you speak to Corey about the bruises that you saw? Yes. And where were you and Corey when you spoke? We were on the walk. And what was Corey's demeanor when you spoke to him about the bruises that you saw? Um, he just seemed upset and scared. Now, calling your attention to March 26th of 2021, did you make a referral to DCPMP? Yes. And can you tell the jurors who DCPMP is? Um, they are the Department of Children, Children's Protection and Permanency. Yeah, are, are people know them as DIFUS? Yeah. And how did you contact DCPMP? Through the hotline. And why did you make a referral to DCPMP at this time? Um, I felt like Corey's abuse was getting really bad, and I felt like they needed to do something about it. Now, drawing your attention to Saturday, March 27th at 2021, did you see Corey that day? I'm sorry, what day was it? Saturday, March 27th of 2021. Did you see Corey that day? Yes. And where did you see Corey? Um, in Stafford or Barnegat. And was, why were you at Stafford or Barnegat to see Corey? Um, it was, he was having flag football tryouts. And where did you go to see the flag football tryouts? Um, I, I think it was South Jersey, like Stafford or Barnegat. Okay. And did you see the flag football tryouts? Yes. And who brought Corey to the tryout? The defendant. And how did you arrive to the field for the flag football tryouts? I drove myself. And why did you meet the defendant there that day? Um, he didn't want to drive with me because he didn't want to be seen with me. I'm too trashy. And what type of contact was allowed for first grade flag football? It's no contact. What, if any, injuries did Corey sustain at the flag football tryout? None. After the flag football tryout, did you take Corey back to your house in Manalvin for visitation? I did. And where did you take Corey to? My house. And did you have a conversation with the defendant at the tryout about bringing Corey back to your home for visitation? Yes. 
And can you tell the jurors what the defendant said in regard to you bringing Corey back to your home? He told me just to take him for the weekend. And were you expecting that you were going to be able to take Corey home from trials? No. And that occurred during the tryout? Yes. Now, in regard to the court-ordered um, visitation schedule, did you and the defendant always follow what was specifically said in the court order? No. And can you tell the jurors why not? Um, I'm not sure. Well, what about, you know, were there be circumstances which would... Oh, yes. Christopher would let me take him to my house knowing the people that he didn't want to be there were there a few times. Okay. Um... When did you bring Corey back um, to the house in Bargainagate after you brought him to your home after flag football? On Sunday. And can you tell the jurors what time did you return Corey to his father the next day? Um, around 6. And while Corey was at your home um, after the flag football triads, what, if any, bruising did you see to his body? Um, he had a large bruise on his chest. He had, um, it looked like fingerprint bruises all over his arms and legs. And he had a very, it was very large on the, like, his hip on his side. Now, besides the bruises, can you tell the jurors about Corey's physical condition? He, he was normal. Now, during your visitation with Corey at your home in Manalapan. Was Corey exposed to anyone with COVID? No. And had anyone in your family attended a funeral? No. Had anyone in your family attended a mass gathering? No. At that time, what did you learn about Corey being out of school? Um, the defendant took him out of school for an apparent or exposed um, to COVID. Did you confront the defendant about this? Yes. All right, we're going to step aside here and take a break. When we come back, the judge is going to be faced with an issue regarding evidence and whether she's going to allow it in front of this jury. We'll have that on the other side. Keep it here on Court TV. Back to court in just a minute. But first, new developments in the case against alleged murderer Brian Koberger. The state is now responding to Koberger's alibi, and I put air quotes around that, saying it isn't detailed enough to clear the defendant of these crimes. Now, earlier this month, Koberger's defense team said their client was driving around in the early hours of November 13th, 2022, quote, as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and star. In response, the state said, quote, the defendant's supplemental alibi response continues to lack the specificity required by Idaho Code 19-519, which provides that the defense shall state the specific place or places at which the defendant claims to have been at the time of the alleged offense. The state then goes on to say the defendant is offering nothing new to his initial alibi, that he was simply driving around during the morning hours of November 13th, 2022. And I agree, Michael. I don't think that's too much of an alibi to keep it that general no and he's still not saying where he was during the period where at least the state says the murders occurred all right and that's part of the reason i don't think they see it as an alibi defense exactly. all right we're going to continue bringing you any new developments on that story now let's turn back to new jersey where the defendant christopher gregor is standing trial charged with endangering the welfare of a child and first degree murder in the death of his own son corey michelo the state says gregor forced the child to run on a treadmill as he repeatedly adjusted the speed causing him to fall off numerous times. Well, he died just weeks later. Now, if convicted, Gregor faces life in prison. Let's get you back inside that courtroom where we're hearing from Corey's mother, Brianna Michelo. March 30th of 2021, did you contact the pediatrician about getting Corey an appointment? Yes. And can you tell the jurors why you contacted the pediatrician? Um, well, because I suspected that um, 
Corey was being abused, and I um, went on the advice of a DCPMP worker. Objection. So sustained. We should strike that. That's, a, that's hearsay. That someone else told her something. So you should strike that and not consider it. If the state calls that person, then we'll deal with it at that time. Thank you. Did you get an appointment with the pediatrician? Yes. And what day was the appointment scheduled for? April 1st. And April 1st was a Thursday? Thursday. And what time was the appointment scheduled for, Brianna? Um, around 5. And why did you make the appointment at 5? Because that's when my parenting time was. And who was um, the appointment made with? What um, pediatrician? IV Pediatrics. And did you have a conversation with the DCPMP case worker? Yes. Without telling us the conversation, what was the case worker's name? Name? Yes. Mark Wal Waltonowski. Calling your attention to March 31st of 2021, did you file an emergent application for full custody of Corey with the family court? Yes. And can you tell the jurors why you did this? I was in fear for Corey's life. And was DCPMP involved in this process? Yes. Now, on April 1st of 2021, what time did you pick up Corey that day for visitation? Around 4.30. And after you picked up Corey, where did you take him? Um, to the pediatrician. And what was the name of, of the pediatrician or the practice? Um, IV Pediatrics. And what town was the pediatrician located in? Tom's River. And when you picked up Corey that day, what was Corey's demeanor? Um, he was fine. And when you picked up Corey that day, what was his physical condition? He still had some bruises, but other than that, he was normal. And when you got to the pediatrician's office, did Corey speak to the doctor? Yes. And was Corey examined by the doctor? Yes. And did you speak to the doctor? I did. Now, based upon this conversation, where did you take Corey next? Um, the community medical center. And where is Community Medical Center located? I believe in Tom's River. And why did you um, take uh, Corey to Community Medical Center in Tom's River? To be examined further, and he needed to get x-rays and blood work. OK. And while you were either at the pediatrician or on your way to um, Community Medical Center, did you receive um, the family court order regarding your emergent application? Yes. Very Your Honor, permission to approach? Yes, of course. What is S17? Brianna, I'm now showing you what's been marked S17 um, um, for identification uh, purposes. And um, can you please read the caption at the top of um, to saying that who okay. the, the court order is from? Honorable Patrick Bradshaw, G JSC, Superior Court of New Jersey, Chancery Division, Family Park. Okay. Now calling your attention to um, this order, um, can you tell us um, who opened um, this court order? I did. Okay. And the court, can you read on the first paragraph, starting with, and the court having considered, what was the court, or the court considered? Objection. What's the basic position? How would she know what the court considered? It's, it's in a document. Well, I think the, the, the question is that the order recites what the court considered. Do you have an objection to that? Nope. Right, but that's the question. What, what did, can you read off the order, please? Right here. Yeah, you could start with. Okay, the and the court. court having considered the paper submitted and the court having reviewed a letter of investigatory findings submitted by the Department of Child Protection and Permanency and good cause having been shown, it is on this first day of April 2021 ordered as follows. Okay, and as the court order 
continues, you were denied your request for emergency, emergent custody, correct? Correct. And then going, continuing with this order, um, specifically in subsection two, can you read for the jury what the court order says? It says, upon recommendation by DCPMP, this court orders that the party's minor child, Corey, undergo a CPC evaluation as a part of its ongoing investigation. The party okay, I could just stop you there. And, and a CPC evaluation, that would in essence be uh, uh, an examination for what was going on with Corey and the bruising, correct? Okay. It doesn't matter, Judge. I can withdraw the question. Well, it's leading, so okay. it's still sustained. We'll, we'll go to subsection three, if you could read for, for what the order says. The court also orders the parties to confer with one another to agree upon a date and time in which Corey shall be made available for an examination by his pediatrician regarding Corey's bruising, bruising within seven days of this order. Okay. After Corey was at the pediatrician, where did you take him next? To the hospital. And um, what hospital, again, did you take him to? Com community Medical Center. And how did you drive Corey to Community Medical Center? In my car. And what was Corey's physical condition while in the car? He was okay. And can you tell the jurors what Corey's demeanor was when he was in the car? Um, same as always, he was normal. And about what time did you arrive at Community um, Medical Center? Um, probably like between six and seven. And was Corey examined at Community Medical Center? Yes. And what department was this in? The emergency room. And did Corey speak to the doctor? Yes. And did you speak to the doctor? Yes. And based upon your conversation, where did you take Corey next? Um, Jersey Shore Medical Center. Now, while you were at Community Medical Center, before you got to Jersey Shore, um, did the defendant send you a text message as to where you were? Yes. Your Honor, permission to approach? Yes. Seven. Yes. Okay. I'm now showing you what has been marked S7 for identification purposes. And do you um, recognize uh, these? Yes. And are these what? Um, text messages between me and the defendant. Okay. And calling your attention um, on S7 in particular to the first text message contained in the document, can you please tell the jury what the defendant uh, texted you? Judge, you can object since it's a document, not in evidence. I don't know how she could read from it. Your Honor, we already had a 104 hearing. Where you want to move it to evidence? I can move them into evidence. I was going to do it at the end, but... Okay, I'll, I'll agree to that. Okay, so I have the other ones, too, I can move into evidence. So the state will move it into evidence as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear about these text messages, the statements of the defendant. You can consider his statements. I'm going to give you an instruction later about... And again, she's describing that Corey was fine. He was in fine physical condition. He was okay in the car. Or she's taking him to the next hospital for more tests. And I think what the doctors say about what happened to this child is at the center of this case and whether or not the prosecution can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, she took him to the hospital, took him to the, her own doctor, the pediatrician. 
No one really raised any red flags about abuse, so I'm a little confused. Yeah, but then there. we hear there was chronic abuse, yeah. so there's going to need to be a lot of medical evidence in this case. But mm. when we come back, you don't want to miss it. Mother's still on the stand under direct examination. We'll be right back. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a closer look at the crime scene in the trial of Karen Reed, the Massachusetts woman who claims that she's being framed for the murder of her police officer boyfriend. Plus, a deep dive into new revelations from today's gripping testimony. What was the question that she asked? Is he dead? We're live from Massachusetts with the latest in the killer or cover-up murder trial. Closing argument with Vinny Palatan. Tonight at 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Michael Ayala here with Judge Ashley Wilcott. Christopher Greger claims that his son, Corey, died of natural causes, but prosecutors say he abused the child to death. Well, now the defendant is facing life in prison if he's found guilty of first-degree murder. Let's get you back inside the courtroom. We hit the pause button. Right now, we are hearing from Corey's mother, Brianna. She is still on direct examination by the state. I'll ask you to consider them at the end of the case in connection with that instruction. Uh, in addition, in terms of the statements of Ms. Michelow, they're actually hearsay, but she's here testifying about it. So I'll allow them in for that reason. I concluded it wouldn't make much sense for me just to give you the defendant's statements or responses if you couldn't see the other half of the conversation. So in order to be able to give you a full picture, I'm allowing both Ms. Michelow's messages and the defendant's alleged responses into evidence in order to give you that context to be able to analyze them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so turning your attention then to um, S7 in particular at the um, top of the page at approximately 4-1. Um, um, can you read the time for the jurors? Um, 7-26. Okay, and what did the defendant text you? He said, where are you? And what did he text you next? He said, it'll be past 7-30 and I will take over and be with my son. And what did he say after that? I have no idea where you are, and you will not tell me on the phone. Why is that? You were past your time by the court order, and I want to be there for my son. Oh, and what was your response to that? I said, I am driving to Jersey Shore Medical Center. I'm doing what a caseworker for DCPMP told me to do. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Brianna, while you were at Community Medical Center, did you sign Corey out of the hospital? Yes. And can you tell the jurors why you did this? Um, because I wanted to drive him myself to Jersey Shore Medical Center. And why did you want to drive him yourself to Jersey Shore Medical Center? Because um, I was already late and I didn't want to spend another 30 minutes waiting. And what had the hospital offered at the time? Um, to transport Corey. Now, while Corey was at Community Medical Center, um, was he physically examined? Yes. <clears throat> and what was Corey's condition at Community Medical Center? Um, he was fine. Now, did Jersey Shore Medical Center have a pediatric abuse specialist on staff? Yes. And while all this was happening, did you speak to Bark, the DCPMP worker? Yes. Now, after you and Corey left Community Medical Center, where did you immediately go? Um, Jersey Shore Medical Center. And what was Corey's physical condition while you were with Corey in the car? Um, fine, he was just watching videos on my phone. And what was Corey's demeanor? Um, normal, happy. Now, approximately what time did you arrive at Jersey Shore Medical Center with Corey? Um, around eight. And did you speak to the doctor at Jersey Shore Medical Center? Yes. And did Corey speak to the doctor at Jersey Shore Medical Center? Yes. And what was Corey's demeanor while at Jersey Shore Medical Center? Um, 
He was okay. He was just a little tired because it was getting late. And was Corey examined by a doctor at Jersey Shore Medical Center? He was. And what tests were performed on Corey at Jersey Shore Medical Center? Um, he had an x-ray and blood work. And while Corey was at Jersey Shore Medical Center, was he seen by the pediatric abuse specialist? I believe so. Or is he seen by an emergency room doctor? Um, I think it was an emergency room doctor. Now, while you were at Jersey Shore Medical Center on April 1st of 2021, did you have a telephone conversation with the defendant? Yes. And about what time did that conversation occur? Um, around 8.30. And can you tell us about the conversation you had with the defendant? Um, he called me and he asked me to leave the hospital with Corey. And um, I said I wouldn't. I want him to be checked out. And then he started just verbally attacking me and fighting with me. And did the defendant know that you were at Jersey Shore Hospital with Corey? Yes. And can you tell us what happened at the hospital regarding your cell phone? My phone died. Now, at 11.43 p.m., did the defendant send you a text message asking you where you were? Yes. Your Honor, permission to approach? Now your Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to give you that instruction now. We're getting into a lot of statements allegedly made by Mr. Greger. So some of these are written electronically, say by text message, and now we're talking. All right, still with us to help break it down, trial attorney Latif Gray. Latif, here's what I always struggle with is at this moment in time, she's doing everything right. She took him to the pediatrician. They sent her to the community medical center. They saw a pediatric abuse specialist. He was then sent to Jersey Shore Medical Center. The mom did that. And yet here we are with a dead child. Yeah, it's tragic. Uh, it appears that somebody slipped up and uh, didn't take care of their responsibilities. And it doesn't seem like it's the mother who was the one who slipped up. I mean, she made over 100 complaints about abuse, none of them substantiated. So somebody fell asleep at the wheel here. And unfortunately, the, the cute baby is no longer here because of it. Well, Latif, when we talk about evidence, somebody might have dropped the ball, but the fact is that suggests that maybe they couldn't prove that this abuse was going on. And, and I disagree that the mother did everything right. They told her, they gave her a choice. They said, look, we'll, we'll transport support this kid. We think he's relatively serious. We want to go from community um, hospital to this larger hospital mm -hmm. that can deal with more serious situations. She chose to drive him herself. Had he remained under doctor's care, been transported by mm -hmm. doctors, by an ambulance, maybe this doesn't happen. So I'm wondering how that might play into the case. Well, that's an interesting dynamic. I mean, um, whether or not she should have let the hospital continue to maintain care of her child, that's a real interesting issue. But the fact still remains that she did take him to the hospital. She did do the follow-up that they suggested. So she did what she could to ensure that her son was not being abused and that if he was being abused, that it was being taken care of. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword, but it appears that she did what she, what she could do. And, you know, I always have to say it could have been a financial issue. It's a lot to have mm -hmm. a child transported when you can do it yourself and save that money or not be able to pay a bill. I'm not saying that's the reason, but I don't know. There are just a lot of factors. Choice, yeah, it is. It is. All right. Thank you so much, Latif Gray, of course, for joining us this hour. All right, folks, coming up, we're going to have a lot more. Actually, before we go to break, I do want to um, talk a little bit about that choice that she made. So, for instance, 
When we're talking about abuse, we're talking about the last known abuse, the one we see on tape, mm -hmm. is March 20th. Right. This is 12 days later. She's in front of doctors, right. pediatric abuse specialists. No one sees signs of abuse. So can you then deduce, if you're a jury, that there was any abuse going on between the 20th and that day? I think only if you have medical experts who can say, looking at x-rays, looking at the test, we can tell you we have all of these old injuries that had to have been blunt force trauma, for instance. Otherwise, I think it's hard to prove. All right. Those are real big questions in this case, folks. Stick around. Coming up, that treadmill video is going to be played for the jury. More from the trial against Christopher Greger. That's coming up next. Keep it here on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. And I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Ahead this hour, the missing, the mother rather, of missing three-year-old Elijah Vu wants her bond reduced. We will hear what the judge has to say. Also, it was a short day of testimony in the killer or cover-up murder trial as police and medical personnel testify about the crime scene and finding victim John O'Keefe in the snow. And opening statements begin in Court TV's newest case, the treadmill abuse murder trial in New Jersey. All right, in that trial, 31-year-old Christopher Greger is charged with first-degree murder in the death of his six-year-old son, Corey Mitchell. Now, prosecutors claim that Greger forced his son to run on a treadmill because he believed the boy was, in his words, too fat. Now, though they don't believe the treadmill caused Corey's death, the state says the child suffered from chronic abuse. The defense admits video shows Gregor making his son get on the treadmill multiple times, but they claim Corey's death was not murder. Corey's mother, Brianna Michelow, is still on the stand for direct examination by the state. Let's get you back inside the courtroom. So, um, Brianna, at approximately 11.43 p.m., while you were at Jersey Shore Medical Center, did the defendant send you a text message asking where you were? Yes. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness? Yes, absolutely. Good. Hey, Brianna, I'm now showing you what's been marked S8 for identification purposes. And um, do you recognize that? Yes. And those are text messages from your phone? Yes. And you're familiar with those text messages? I am. Your Honor, permission to enter into evidence and publish? Sir, sure, that's S8. S8. Any objection? None. S8 and evidence. Okay, now calling your attention to the first um, message, can you tell the jurors um, what the defendant said to you and what time that this occurred? Um, at 1143, the defendant said, why are you now ignoring me? And can you tell the jurors what your response was? I said, my phone died and I just got a charger. I'm at the hospital because DC, DCPMP spoke to doctors and they told me to come here. You could have came here from the beginning. You said no, drop him off. We could have taken turns the whole time. I'm not doing anything wrong. Stay up and I'll drop him off as soon as we're done. Can you please turn the page? No calling your attention. Can you please uh, continue? to um, read the first two um, messages with the um, dates and the time as well to the jury. On 4 one at 1152, I said, you're not going to stay awake. And then um, on 4 2 at 1248, I said, how are you going to go to court and say anything about me keeping him? You won't even stay up for me to drop him off and I'm offering now. Okay, thank you. Now, after those um, text messages, when is the next time you um, heard from the defendant? Um, the next morning, or that morning. Now, was Corey released from Jersey Shore Medical Center? Yes. And can you tell the jurors about his blood work? Um, it was all normal. And what about in regard to any x-rays or scans? That was normal as well. And 
was that text message at approximately 11.43, was that the last time that you had contact with the defendant that evening? Yes. And can you tell the jurors why would you try to bring Corey back to his father's house from Jersey Shore Medical Center? Um, so I didn't break the court order. Now, after you left Jersey Shore with Corey, um, can you tell the jurors where you went? I went to my house in English Town. And how long of a ride was it? Um, about 45 minutes. And what was Corey's demeanor in the car ride? Um, he was tired. It was 1 a.m. and he um, fell asleep in the car. And about what time did you then arrive at your home? Um, I want to say like around 1.30. Okay. And when you got to your house, can you tell us who was awake? No one. And when you got to your house, where did you and Corey immediately go? We went to my bedroom. And where was your bedroom located in the house? In the basement. And where did you and Corey sleep that night? We slept in my bed. And while you slept in bed with Corey, what was his physical condition? Um, he was okay. And can you tell the jurors what Corey's demeanor was while you slept in bed with him? Um, normal. And can you tell the jurors why you slept in bed with Corey that night? It was just easier because it was really late and I just didn't want to get him ready in his room. What time did um, you and Corey wake up the next morning? Around 7, 7.30. And when Corey woke up, did you dress him? Yes. And where did you dress Corey? In my room. And what did you dress Corey in? Um, I put him in a sweatshirt, jeans, and um, sneakers. And what about his underwear? Um, they were blue underwear. And what was the condition of the clothes that you dressed Corey in? Um, they were clean. And after you dressed Corey, where did the two of you then go? Um, we ate breakfast in the kitchen. And when you went upstairs to eat breakfast in the kitchen, um, who was there? My mom and her boyfriend, Richie. And did Corey have breakfast? Yes. And did he eat? He did. And do you remember what he ate? He ate a bagel and a go -gurt. And were you with Corey the entire time that he was eating breakfast? Yes. And can you tell the jurors what was Corey's physical condition in the morning when he was eating breakfast? He was okay. He was and what about his demeanor? Um, normal. He was fine. Now, that morning of the 2nd at approximately 6.48 a.m., did you receive a text message from the defendant? Yes. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness? Yes. Yes, the rest of them. You saw them already? Oh, okay. Oh. Grant, I'm now showing what's been marked um, S8, which has already been admitted to evidence. Turning your attention to um, the text mess uh, message conversation, can you please um, tell the jurors what the defendant said, starting um, with that particular message, and can you... Um, let the jurors know the, um, the time. time and the date as well. Okay. On 4-2, 21, at 6.46 a.m., he said, I'm going to court because you decided to go when you had seven days last night, and by your text, you were still there at 12.50 at night. You had detriment to Corey's health, and I will be, will be going to court today about it. And can you read the uh, next message from the defendant as well? Yes, 6.46. He said, by the way, school starts at 8.30, so have him back before 8.30. Brianna, after Corey um, had breakfast, where did you drive to? To the defendant's house. And when you were driving um, to the defendant's house in Barnegat, where was Corey seated in the car? He was in the back seat. And how long of it was a drive to Barnegat? About an hour. 
And what was Corey doing while you were driving um, to Barnegat with him in the car? He was watching YouTube on the, my phone. And what was Corey's demeanor in the car? He was okay. Now, well, while you were driving Corey to Barnegat, did you receive um, a text message um, from the defendant? I did. permission to approach? Yes, sir. Grant, I'm now showing you what has been marked S9 for identification purposes. Do you recognize this? Yes. And can you're familiar with that? I am. And is that a text message um, that you received from the defendant which was located on your phone? Yes. And can you please tell the jurors what the defendant uh, texted you, including the date and the time of the text message? Yes. On 4 2 21 at 8 37 a.m., he said, I mean, considering you did kidnap my son for an entire day and night, the minimum that is happening is an entire day and night is going to be removed from your next visit maximum. Hopefully, the courts will agree with my application this morning and you will lose all rights. Now, when you got to the um, defendant's um, apartment complex to drop off Corey, where did you park? In front of the defendant's home. And about what time did you get um, to the apartment complex to drop off Corey that morning? Around 9 a.m. And when you got there, where was the defendant's car? Um, I'm not sure. It wasn't there. And did you text the defendant asking where he was? Yes. And what did the uh, defendant uh, say to you in regard to where he was? He said he was home. And before Corey had left the car, did you provide Corey with a piece of paper? I did. And what did you give Corey? It was a paper from the hospital that had um, information so the defendant could look at his um, records. And why did you do that? Um, I was just being nice. And. Did you speak to Corey in the car before you sent him into the defendant's home? I did. And was that the last time that you spoke to Corey? It was. Did Corey exit your car? He did. And can you tell the jurors where Corey walked? He walked inside the um, defendant's home. And how was Corey walking when he went to the defendant's apartment? Fine. And did Corey open the apartment door of yep. the defendant's apartment? Yes. Now, continuing on in the morning of April 2nd of 2021, were you and the defendant arguing? Yes. Okay, I have permission to approach yes. S11. showing you what's been uh, marked um, S11 for identification purposes. And again, are those text messages that were contained in your phone? And you're familiar with those messages? I am. Your Honor, at this time, the state would uh, move to publish and, and into evidence of uh, S11? No objection. S11 and evidence. So, Brianna, um, starting with the top uh, message, can you please uh, tell the jury about your conversation um, with the uh, defendant? Yes, at 9.48 a.m., I said, stop being so cocky. If I were you, I definitely wouldn't be. 
And yeah. then what did the um, defendant respond? He said, yes, I am a ludicrous charged by you that when you went to court yesterday was completely thrown out and disregarded. And can you continue with his uh, next message? He said, shows how much evidence there is, doesn't it? You're going to be in for a rude awakening today. So, um, Brianna, what is the next time that you heard from the defendant on April 2nd of 2021? Around, um, 3.30. And did you speak to the defendant on the telephone? Yes. And at 3.30 on April 2nd, what did the defendant tell you about Corey? He said um, he was lethargic. Um, his legs were hurting. Um, he was sleeping all day. And um, uh, he was throwing up and just didn't feel good. And then he told me to send Corey's insurance card to him. And did you send the All right, we do need to hit the, hit the pause button right now to bring you this update in the Doomsday Prophet murder trial going on in Idaho. Court was dark today while both sides took care of administrative issues. Chad Daybell is accused of killing his wife, Tammy, and the two children of his current wife, Lori, JJ, and Tylee. And during testimony yesterday, two of Tammy's cousins testified. One told the jury the defendant told her parents conflicting stories about Tammy's death. Another cousin became emotional as she testified about how Daybell spoke very negatively about Tammy at her wake. Now, testimony is scheduled to resume tomorrow morning at 1030 Eastern. Our Court TV cameras will be there to bring it to you. All right, we need to take a short break. We'll get back to the treadmill abuse murder trial up next, where the mother, Brianna Michelow, testifies about how she found out her son had died. Keep it here on your front row seat to Justin. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a closer look at the crime scene in the trial of Karen Reed, the Massachusetts woman who claims that she's being framed for the murder of her police officer boyfriend. Plus, a deep dive into new revelations from today's gripping testimony. What was the question that she asked? Is he dead? We're live from Massachusetts with the latest in the killer or cover-up murder trial. Closing Arguments with Vinny Palatan. Tonight at 8, 7 Central, only on Court TV. We'll get you back inside that courtroom in just a moment. But first, let's bring in trial and civil attorney and law professor at Temple University Law School, Dante Mills. Dante, thank you for joining us both. Of course, you know, in this case, to me, it sounds like causation is really going to be the biggest issue because defense in its opening said natural causes sepsis. That's what killed this six-year-old, whereas the prosecution is saying, no, 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 chronic abuse by the father. But these are things I would think experts could really help explain to the jury. I don't know if they can. This case is, is circumstantial evidence because what they're saying is there was chronic abuse that led uh, to essentially uh, his body kind of breaking down um, and, and those other issues. But I don't know if they have specific instances where there was physical abuse. If you have that, and you can point to him hitting him before or something like that, then you can say, okay, this was chronic. But they're kind of highlighting the incident where he was pushing him on the treadmill. Um, I know that, you know, he fell a couple of times. He was pushing him to get up. That's not physical abuse. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna come down to a situation where the father, and it's really gonna be interesting to see if he takes the stand to say, he was in my care, I was watching him, I never touched him. Um, he may have come into my home that way from his mom, we don't know that. And if you throw that kind of question into it, where you don't have specific instances of that actual physical abuse, it's a circumstantial case, and it's really gonna come down to whose side you believe, the mom or the father, um, and, and I don't know if a jury is gonna be able to get beyond a reasonable doubt if you can't point to specific evidence prior of physical abuse. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly what yep. I see. And I think that evidence of him and how he's treating his kid 
on the treadmill is so important for the state's case because that kind of paints him as an abuser. You see it and you get angry. You don't like the guy. You hear some of his texts and things he's saying. You don't like the guy. But at the end of the day, Dante, she was at the hospital. This was 12 days after the treadmill incident. And she saw a, and a pediatric abuse expert. She saw a doctor, went to another hospital. No one raised red flags as to the abuse. And I think that's going to be problematic for the state. Absolutely. That's, that's a phenomenal point. Uh, and if I'm the defense attorney, I'm bringing in the fact that all of these investigations were going on. Listen, she's trying to get custody from, take custody from me. She keeps making these allegations. They keep being investigated and none of them are true. So how do you now suggest that there's chronic abuse where I was just investigated, right? He was just uh, uh, reviewed or, or, or observed by a doctor and they didn't see anything to suggest that. So how can you say that now? I'm gonna be screaming that if I'm the defense attorney that we actually, not often do you have evaluations and medical examinations right before death where you could say, there was no sign of that chronic abuse that they're talking about. So it's about controlling the narrative um, and that's one way that they can try and turn the narrative of all of these uh, allegations into some kind of proof that, in fact, he was not chronically abusing him. Yeah, and, and to your point, Judge, that's why it's going to be so important what the doctors say yeah. about this chronic abuse. Yes. If they can really convince this jury chronic abuse was going on, they can believe that that might have compromised the boy and led him to the situation that he was in. That's the only way. And how specific of time frames can they say the abuse happened? Therefore, it had to have been by the father. The child was in his care at that time. We have to wait and see. There you go. A lot of questions for this one. All right, Dante, stand by. I want to take folks back into court now where Brianna Michelow is still testifying about the last time that she saw her and alive, and when she found out, he died. And did the defendant say anything about taking Corey to the hospital? Yes. And did the defendant tell you what hospital he was taking Corey to? No. Was that the last time that you had spoken to the defendant on that day? Yes. And did you learn what hospital Corey was taken to? Yes. After the um, phone conversation, did you know at that time what hospital Corey was taken to? No. And at that time, what did you do? Um, I started calling the hospitals to see if Corey was there. Um, I also called um, my local police department um, to um, kind of um, report Corey as like, I don't know where he is and I, I, he's not feeling good, he's sick. And about six o'clock that day on the second, did the police come to your home? Yes. And did you learn at that time that Corey had passed? I did. Now, on that same day that Corey passed away, did you go to the police station and provide a statement? I did. And whom did you speak to? Um, Detective Dennis Mitchell. And what did you give to Detective uh, Mitchell at the uh, police station? My cell phone. And did you voluntarily provide that to the detective? Yes. And did you also um, allow officers to photograph your home in English Town? Yes. The photos. Our permission to Please. approach. 
Hannah, I'm now showing you what's been marked um, S21, S20, S23, S19, S35, S32, S33, and S24, and S, I'm sorry, S34, and also S24. Now, calling your attention to S22, uh, are you familiar with the um, area yes. depicted there? And can you tell the jurors what that is? It's a TV stand in my bedroom. Okay, and in your hand, you're holding a what? Photograph. Okay, and you're familiar with that because it's in your bedroom? Correct. I'm now showing you what's been marked um, S23 for identification purposes. And can you tell the jurors what that is? This is my bedroom. Okay, and what you're holding is, is what, a photograph? All right, we do need to squeeze in a break right now. We'll get you back to Brianna Michelow's testimony about the investigation that ensued after the death of her son when we come back. Keep it here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcox. And I'm Michael Ayala. We are continuing our coverage of the treadmill abuse murder trial going on in New Jersey. The mother of six-year-old Corey has been on the stand for several hours. She's testified about the bruises she saw on her son and about the last time that she saw him alive. Brianna Michelow is still on the stand on direct, testifying about the investigation into Corey's death. Let's get you back into court. Photograph. Okay, I'm now showing you what's been marked S20. Is this another photograph? Yes. Okay, and can, are you familiar with the area depicted in that photograph? Yes. And what is that? It's the entrance to my house. Okay, I'm now showing you what's been marked S21. Are you uh, familiar with that photograph? Yes. And what is that a picture of? It's a hallway to my bedroom. Okay, so you're familiar with what's depicted in that photograph. I'm now gonna show you what has been marked S19, are you familiar with the area depicted in that photograph? Yes. And can you tell the jurors what that is a photograph of? Um, it's a photo of the defendant's home. And you've been to that location before? Yes. I'm now showing you what has been marked S24. And are you familiar as to what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. And what's depicted in that photograph? It's the paper I gave Corey to go inside with. Okay, so you're familiar with that paper because it was under your control and then you gave it to Corey. Yes. I'm now showing you what's been marked S34 for identification purposes. And do you recognize that? Yes. And what is that a photograph of? Corey's underwear. And um, is that the underwear that you um, put on uh, Corey? Um, when you drove him to the defendant's house on April 2nd of 2021? Yes. And in regard to that photograph, is what's depicted in that photo um, the condition of the underwear that you sent Corey with that day in going to the home? No. And I'm now showing you what's been marked S33, and are you familiar with that? Yes. And what is that a photograph of? Corey's underwear. And again, is the underwear in the same condition as to when you sent Corey in that underwear to the defendant's home? No. I'm now showing you what's been marked S32 for identification purposes. And again, is that the um, underwear that you sent um, Corey in, um, a photo of that um, on April 2nd of 2021? No. That's not the underwear? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. And is the condition the same? No. Okay. And I'm now showing you what's marked S35 for identification purposes. And can you tell the jurors what that is? That's Corey's underwear. And again, you're familiar with that? And that's the underwear yes. that you sent him in? Yes. 
And it, was that the condition it was when you sent them in an oh. underwear? Your Honor, um, the state would ask the permission to uh, publish and move into evidence the photos. Your Honor, can I just see this 22 and 23? Sure. Ms. Lento, I'd like you to put them in order so we can go through them in numerical order sure. and we enter into evidence. And you can show 22 and 23, Mr. Blue. I'm giving it to you. She's going to give it to you. 22? and S-32 through S-35, is that right? Yes, Judge. All right, That's so right. S-19 through and including S-24 in evidence, S-32 through and including S-35 in evidence. Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, at this point, um, we would ask for permission to publish the photos to the jury. Thank you. Okay, Brianna, so you're familiar with that location? Yes. And can you tell the um, jurors what that location is? That's the defendant's home. And the day that you dropped um, Corey off back to his father on April 2nd, um, can you show the jurors where you parked that day using the photograph of S-19, which is now before the jury. Yeah, it was um, all the way to the right, the second spot to the left. Um, we could go to the next picture. <clears throat> okay, I'm now showing you S-20, which has been published to the jury. And can you tell the jurors what that is a picture of? That's the entrance of my home. So when you came home with Corey um, around one something, on uh, April 2nd, um, is that where you and uh, Corey entered the home? Yes. And what area in your home does that depict? Um, the entrance and the living rooms to the left and my um, bedroom doors to the right after the hallway. Uh, we can move to S21, please. Okay, now you can see S21, which has been published to the jury. And can you tell the jurors what is depicted in that photograph? That's um, the stairs and the hallway to my bedroom. S22, please. And can you tell the jurors what that is? That's a TV stand in my bedroom. Okay, and why is that TV stand uh, there um, in your bedroom? Um, to hold the TV. And um, is that where you would generally sleep downstairs? Yes. Okay. If we could then go to S23. And can you tell the jurors what that is a picture of? Uh, my bedroom. Okay. Now, the night that you brought Corey back to your home in English Town on April 2nd at 1 something in the morning, can you show the jury where you and Corey slept? Yes, it was the bed on the left. Next picture, please. I'm now showing you what's been marked S24, which has been published to the jury. And can you tell the jurors what that is a photograph of? Um, that's the paper the hospital gave me that I gave Corey to give to the defendant. And I'm now showing you if we could move to the next photo. S32, and can you tell um, the jurors what S32, the photograph, shows? There are Corey's underwear. Now, is that the underwear that you sent Corey in to his defendant's home on April 2nd of 2021? Yes. And 
if we can move to the next picture, please. I'm now showing you what's been marked S33. Is that the underwear that you um, sent Corey in to the defendant's home on uh, April 2nd? Yes. Now, when you sent Corey in this underwear, was that the condition of the underwear? No. And what was the condition of the underwear when you sent Corey um, to the home? They were clean. And can we now go to S34? And again, is this a photo of the underwear that you dressed Corey in when you brought him to the defendant's home on April 2nd? Yes. And is that the condition of the underwear? No. S35. And again, the underwear on S35 as the photograph, was that the condition of the underwear that um, you sent uh, Corey in when you um, brought him to the defendant's home? No. And what was the condition of the underwear that you sent? They were clean. S36. Oh, no S36, Judge. All right, we didn't get to that yet. Yep. You want to do it? When we come back, we'll hear the last conversation between Brianna and her son, Corey. That's coming up right on the other side of this break. Everyday people, just like you, accused of the unthinkable. He needed to eliminate this person. This is, in fact, a murder. Accomplice to Murder returns with an all-new season. I know the manipulation. I know the lies. Taking you beyond the ringleaders. This is somebody he trusted. And into the heart of the case. They were in this together. Accomplice to Murder with Vinny Politan. All-new season premieres Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. All right, folks, before we head back to court, let's bring in trial and civil attorney and law professor at Temple University Law School, Dante Mills. And Dante, you know, at this point, we're, we're hearing testimony about those moments leading up to the child's death. And clearly, it seems to me the state is trying to establish the fact that he was in good hands with mom uh, before taking him over there. Um, but again, I still think they have this issue of what exactly caused the death. It, it's, you can't escape it. You're right, and and they are walking through questions as they should uh, with Brianna, the mom, uh, saying, you know, when he got out of the car, did he walk normally? Um, was he lethargic when he when you finally saw when you saw him last? And she's answering those questions the correct way, saying no. Uh, when he was in my care, he was okay, which means this must have happened after I turned him over. But when you have to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, this must have happened. I don't know if it quite gets you there. And when I'm a defense attorney, I'm looking at the case and the first thing I do when I'm prepping, I'll call my business partner, Lynn, and I'll say, listen, what are the worst, what's the worst fact that we have against us and how do we deal with it? And looking at her testimony so far today, the worst fact is a, a couple of days before or we about a week and a half before, she saw bruising on him. However, that's countered by the fact that every all of the medical professionals that looked said that was no cause for alarm. It's countered by the fact that the dad says that's from playing football, which would naturally cause bruising if you're hit or tackled um, and, and running on the treadmill. So if that's the worst fact they have right now to show some uh, form or, or process of abuse that was consistent, I think it's kind of light. It's a tragedy uh, that, that Corey died. Um, and whenever a child dies, you want to find the person responsible. You want to take them off the street so they can never hurt another child. I just don't know if they have enough evidence here to say where this happened, when this happened, and how it happened. And his jury may require that. But continuing to put him back on the treadmill, I think, is problematic for the look it gives the defendant, even if it's not technically a definition of abuse. I think some can argue it is abuse. All right, but we need to get back to court. The jury will be hearing the last recorded conversation between the mother, Brianna, and her six-year-old son, Corey. Because he wants the doctor, and I just want to make sure he sees that, okay? I'm not sure where he is. 
Yeah, he's inside. I don't know why the car is not here. That's strange. Okay, Brianna. So, in regard to um, the um, video recording that um, we just saw and listened to, is that your voice depicted on the recording? Yes. And who is the other voice depicted on the recording? My son, Corey. And obviously you're familiar with Corey's voice. Yes. And the conversation that you had with Corey on April 2nd of 2021, uh, a little past 9 um, a.m. that morning, does that accurately depict the conversation that you had with him, what was shown in this uh, video? Yes. Yeah. Did you know that you were recording this conversation at the time? No. And how did it come to be that um, this uh, conversation that you had with Corey um, was recorded? Um, Detective Dennis Mitchell from the prosecutor's office called me and asked me about it. Okay. And Detective Mitchell had your cellular phone? Um, yes. Okay. And was this video recorded on your cellular phone? Yes. And did you purposely record this on your cellular phone? No. And how did it come to be that the recording existed from your cellular phone? I must have accidentally took the video. Your Honor, uh, permission uh, to approach the uh, witness? Yes. Yes, can you be seated? Yes, it's been one. Mario. Flash drive. Video. Okay, I'm now showing you what has been marked S18 for identification purposes. And can you tell the jurors what S18 is? Um, it's a flash drive. And are you familiar as to the contents which are contained on this flash drive? Yes. And did you review the contents of this flash drive before you came to court today? Yes. Now, contained within this flash drive is um, SA. Mm -hmm. And is SA a surveillance video from the Atlantic Heights apartment complex in Barnegat from March 20th of 2021? Yes. And you are familiar with that location as to what is contained on S. Um, 18A. Yes. And you've been to that location before. Yes. And you're also um, familiar uh, with who is depicted on that video, correct? Yes. And in regard to the A video, you are actually present on the video, correct? Yes. And you are familiar with the other parties as well. Yes. I'm now going to draw your attention to S18, what would be B, C, and D. And those are also surveillance videos from the Atlantic Heights uh, apartment uh, complex gym, um, correct? Yes. And you have reviewed those videos before you came to court today, correct? Yes. And you are familiar with the location which is depicted on uh, C, I'm oh, sorry, B, C, and D? Yes. And you're also familiar with the parties who are located on those surveillance videos. Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move into evidence. Um, S18, A, B, C, and D of um, S18. No objection. S18, A, B, C, and D. Thank you. And permission to uh, publish, Your Honor, starting with A. Yes.
All right, we have to hit the pause button. Thank you, of course, to Dante Mills for joining us today. Yeah, building up.